Well, I'm Father Tony Ricard. I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of New Orleans. And I can tell you that I, I've been so blessed through many years to be someone who was willing to listen to what God had to say. But through the years, I can tell you that it's not been as easy as some may think. Because when I was young, although I probably thought God was calling me to the priesthood, I never thought that he would want somebody like me. You see, I'm known for my personality. I'm known for being a happy person. I'm, I'm known for bringing joy. How many of y'all got them towels in the bathroom that can't nobody touch? <laughs> but why you got towels? Sometimes people think that it's all joy, but you know, with life we have those ups and downs. Everybody has trials and tribulations. And so when I was young, I never thought that God wanted a priest like me. Yeah, the towels can't nobody touch. Yo, how many of y'all mama got that little soap dish with them little soaps in them, little fancy soaps? Can't nobody use them? Why you buy stuff can't nobody use? But she always had to make sure the house was ready just in case somebody came in. I like life. I love life. And I enjoy almost every moment I can. And so growing up, I, I really thought that I was going to be a doctor. And I wanted to be a doctor mainly because my first grade teacher, Ms. Herdeen Scott, told me I could be a doctor. Now, years later, when I was a New Orleans public school teacher, I asked Ms. Scott, why did she tell me I could be a doctor? And she said, it was simple, baby, because of your handwriting. My handwriting was so bad that Ms. Scott said I could be a doctor mainly because of the fact that that was the only handwriting job you could get with that handwriting and make a lot of money. So I, I never really thought about the priesthood because I thought priests had to have good handwritings. Well, throughout high school, I studied to be a doctor, uh, went to college. My, I went to Tulane University in New Orleans. And, you know, uh, at Tulane, my major was psychology pre-med. I wanted to be a doctor. But I always joke and say, once you get a D in biology, you're not supposed to be a doctor. You know, if you can't find a spleen, can't take one out. <laughs> So, so I decided to really follow my heart, and that's when I became a public school teacher. Uh, I actually transferred from Tulane to Loyola University in New Orleans, where I majored in elementary ed. And uh, after graduating from college, I became a, a certified school teacher. And then after three years of being a public school teacher, that's when the priesthood looks good. And <laughs> celibacy is a gift, I promise. And so, but I, but as a school teacher, though, I didn't know it, but God was actually getting me ready to be a priest. I taught at a school which was literally across the street from the seminary in New Orleans. You know, there were times when I would drive by the seminary and I would tell God, I'm thinking about it, just leave me alone. But I think God set me up because I could have been assigned to any public school in New Orleans. Why was I at the one across the street from the seminary? I loved being a third grade teacher. But God had a different plan. And so I remember I was working uh, as a volunteer for a retreat for people with disabilities. It was called HEC, Handicap Encounter Christ. The different people were given talks to give. And on the retreat, I was given a talk. And my talk was supposed to be on change, a human challenge. And so during the talk, what I spoke about was the fact that I was really facing a big dilemma. I had been offered a position uh, to teach abroad in uh, Africa, in Abidjan, in the Ivory Coast. The people that asked me if I would consider teaching there, they knew I was spoiled, you know, and so, so they knew that they had to put enough on the table to make me want to come. So not only did you get the apartment and the car, but they threw the housekeeper in too because they knew I needed somebody to take care of me. And when I told the, the folk on the retreat that I was thinking about, you know, maybe going and teaching for two years at this emerging school, they all clapped like, oh, that's nice and stuff like that. But when I said that I was thinking about going to the seminary, they erupted in applause. It was amazing. So that night I actually sat down and uh, I, there were three seminarians that were working the retreat. So I sat down with these three guys and I said, I have questions and I need answers. So they said, okay, well, what are the questions? And they thought I was going to ask all the spiritual stuff, like, you know, what's it like to, to feel that you're called from God? And, you know, not at all. I already understood that I was being called. I was 26 years old. My, I had the practical questions, like, 
Do you have to have a roommate? What are the bathrooms like? And the biggest question in the world, how do you get toothpaste when you don't have a job? That night, I actually decided that I wanted to be a priest. Now, unlike some guys, you know, I didn't decide I wanted to enter the seminary. That night, I decided I wanted to be a priest. It was March the 17th, 1990. And so the next day after I came home from the retreat, I walked into the den. It was about two in the afternoon. My mom and dad were sitting and they were watching TV. So I walked up and I turned the TV off. Now, I don't know about at y'all house, but at my house, if you turn the TV off, you had better have something to say. <laughs> so my daddy sat up and he looked at me like, what are you doing? And I said, well, I need to talk to y'all. And so he said, okay. So I said, um, I've decided that I want to go back to school. And so my mom was like, okay. And then my dad was thinking, how much did we pay for Tulane? How much did we pay for Loyola? You want to go back to what? And I said, I think I want to go to the seminary. Well, my daddy started crying and my mama started screaming. And I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, I hope y'all are happy. But my mama said, she said, we always knew you'd be a priest. And I was like, well, why didn't you tell me earlier? Then maybe I would have went to the seminary. She said it had to be between you and God. And all truth be told, she was right. Because when, when I entered the seminary, I, I really walked through the doors already saying I'm going to be a priest. A lot of seminarians, when they go in, you know, they're discerning the priesthood. And that, that's a beautiful thing, and I think discernment is great. But by the time I entered the seminary, I was no longer discerning. I had discerned for 26 years. So when I walked through those doors, I literally was going to do what you needed to do to become a priest. And so when I entered the seminary, I, I, I'll never forget, uh, at Lafayette Elementary, which was across the street, one of the ladies there, she was like, she said, you know, when you're going to that seminary, what you going to do when you walk through and they lock the door? I said, it's not prison. I can walk back out. But she said, well, tell them they need to get a baby pool and fill it with holy water and put it in the back of the classroom. And I'm like, well, what's that for? She said, because you have to sit in it. That's the only way you're going to make it through the seminary. And so she was pretty close. But I'm just saying that, that like when I went in the seminary, the one thing I knew was that God was calling me. He said, I mean to stay at your house tonight. I mean to be in your house tonight. I mean to come and visit your house tonight. But the crazy part, he's not talking about the physical house, which is good, because my mama would still have us clean it up. But he's talking about the house that is you. He was calling this guy. Not, he, he didn't want me to go into the seminary and it become like the Play-Doh press. You remember the old Play-Doh press? He used to press the thing and everything pops out looking the same. God wanted me, and he wanted everything that I brought to the table. And so, so when I went to the seminary, I literally was determined that I was going to be me. I was going to stay who I am. Now, that didn't mean I didn't have things to grow. There didn't things I didn't have learned, things to learn. But I knew that if I was going to be happy as a priest, I had to be true to myself. And so I brought who I am, my culture, my history, my, my personality, brought all that to the table. Because I was like, if God called it, God wanted it. And, and I remember that when, when I walked through the doors, uh, a lot of folks, they didn't understand me. They didn't know what I was about. And so, uh, and, and that was a challenge to them because I'm me. And what, what challenged them was they were not used to seminarians who were as open as I am. They were not used to seminarians who were, were as sure of themselves as I am. So I was the type that, that, you know, with the teachers, they knew that if I had a question, I was going to ask it. I was never afraid to ask questions, never afraid to ask questions because I wanted to know. And they also knew that if I, if I really was uh, confident about something, I was going to express it. And so there were times when I think the teachers would go probably into the little faculty dining area and was like, oh my God, if y'all got to deal with this one again. But, but they knew that I was genuine and that I was real. But in the seminary, there are also things that, that challenge people a lot. You know, I come from the inner city of New Orleans. I come from, uh, you know, a, a, a light-skinned African-American family. Uh, and so, I bring a lot of history and culture. For those of you who are trying to figure it out, I'm just a light-skinned black man from New Orleans. And so, like, my mama, we knew that something was about to happen at the house on Saturday morning 
when at eight in the morning, she started blasting gospel music out the front room. Lord, y'all don't understand. I used to hate gospel music on Saturday morning. It had nothing to do with praising Jesus. It had everything to do with it meant we about to get up and start cleaning. I, I come from a community that, you know, are descendants of slaves in America. And, and when, we, when, when I speak, I speak with authority because I know that my ancestors prayed for me. They prayed for me to be a priest. They prayed that I would be Roman Catholic. And, and you know, in, in with that, when I talk about being, you know, coming from the black community, people say, well, you know, well, when did your family become Catholic? Well, let me tell you, my family has been Catholic for as long as we can remember. And in fact, we have traced our family uh, uh, history all the way back to Abidjan in the Ivory Coast. And before they were captured to be enslaved, they were already Roman Catholic. They were Roman Catholic in Abidjan. They were Roman Catholic when they were brought to Haiti. They were Roman Catholic in Louisiana. We know that because of baptism records. We followed our family tree all the way back to the heart of Africa, and they were already Roman. So we didn't convert to the church. We didn't come to somebody else's church. This is our church. And I come from a very, 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 very Catholic family. In our family, we've uh, had, at last count, five priests, two bishops, three religious women, and two religious brothers. And so I come from like a super Catholic family, all of them from the same great grandparents. And so right now, uh, I have a cousin who is the, uh, uh, the superior general of the Josephite community. His name is Bishop John Ricard. I have another cousin who's the Archbishop of Louisville, Kentucky. His name is Shelton Fall. Uh, we have a cousin that's a priest in Boston. Uh, they got me hanging along. Uh, and, you know, and so we, we've been very, very blessed to be a part of a family that when I decided to enter the seminary, we didn't get the shock that a lot of people get. You know, when I decided to enter the seminary, instead of family saying, oh, my God, I can't believe we're going to have a priest, my family says, oh, we got another one. And which is really, really cool. And so so uh, and, and I remember when when my cousin Shelton was being ordained as an auxiliary bishop at the time for New Orleans, my great aunt Emily, she was about 98 years old. We're at the reception and, you know, we already had Bishop Ricard, John Ricard. And, you know, now we had Bishop Fall. And she held my hand and she said, now, Father, does this mean you'll be the third bishop in the family? I'm like, oh, no, girl, I cuss way too much to be somebody bishop. And her exact words, she said, don't we need a bishop who will cuss people out every now and then? She might be right. But I'm just saying that, like, like, you know, what we love in our family is being Catholic. That's part of the story of my vocation is that I came from a family that loved the church. And, you know, when I entered the seminary, though, before I was ordained, I also know that my vocation also enhanced my parents' vocation. See, my mom and dad were called to married life. They were following their vocation to have three children. You know, uh, I'm the baby of the family and, you know, I'm super spoiled, you know, which is why, you know, I had to be a priest because uh, ain't no one woman can handle all this. They had to pay women to take care of me now. But I'm just saying, they're like, like, you know, when I, 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 I entered the seminary, you know, my parents at the time, they were not as devoted to church as they could be. And so I always say my mom and dad were part of the C&E club, Christmas and Easter. That was their main things. But my grandmother is the one that made sure we were in church all the time. And when I entered the seminary, my parents began to become more dedicated to being in church. So they, they began to be at mass regularly. They began to be a part of it. And, and so I know in a very real way, my vocation helped to enhance their vocation. A lot of times when, when a, a son or a daughter enters religious life or, or goes to be ordained, Sometimes, you know, they don't get the same reception that I had in my family. I, I, I had a family that was very open, very excited. They couldn't wait to tell people that, you know, I was going to the seminary. But there are some young men that are in the seminary that have had families that will fight them to say, no, this is not for you. This is not your calling. There were parents who they won't encourage their sons or daughters to enter religious life because they want to have grandchildren. They want to make sure that they, they have, uh, you know, descendants in the family with the family name and all that stuff. And, and I think, you know, who are you to block your child's vocation? Who are you to tell your son or your daughter that God is not calling them? To, to our family, it's an exciting time. And, you know, uh, I know that my mom and dad, they, they not only did they inherit a whole church to be their grandchildren and children, but, but they also were blessed that, you know, I've been blessed to, to help be a father figure for, for some phenomenal young men. 
And so my, my parents literally got grandchildren because of the young men that I, I've helped to raise. And so, so it, it's always amazing when I, I think about, you know, that, that God could use us in more ways than we can imagine. You know, and that's why I always encourage parents, you know, if your son and your daughter is thinking about it, don't discourage them, encourage them. Because in the end, the family will be blessed in great abundance because of the fact that somebody is walking that journey of faith as, as a priest or a religious. But I also know that, that it's not an easy journey. You know, when I was in the seminary, uh, because I am who I am, not everybody was happy. And I'm talking about the seminarians. There were guys who, who were downright upset because um, not only was I a happy person, but academically, I was pretty gifted. So I, I think in all of my seminary years, I had one B. I still hold that priest accountable, but I'm saying. And, and so here I was, a young guy from the inner city, a young guy from the black community, who was literally walking circles around the rest of the guys in the seminary. They couldn't handle the fact that I was as smart as I was. But it wasn't because I, I was, you know, academically gifted, but it was because when I got to the seminary, I was so excited because all I thought was, for five years, somebody was gonna pay for me to eat, sleep, and study. So get everything you can out of it. So, so I, I focused because I didn't have to worry about anything else. Believe it or not, in the seminary, I ended up with two master's degrees because um, I got the Master's of Divinity from Notre Dame Seminary, but I also enrolled at Xavier University in New Orleans and worked on a separate degree in theology because I didn't find the seminary to be that hard. Don't tell the professors. And so, so I worked on a separate degree because I knew that I, I was never going to have this opportunity again to get everything I could. So I did summer schools, I did night school, I did everything I could, and, and that was exciting for me. But I can tell you that it challenged many of them. But there were a couple guys in the seminary who, who loved me. And so they, uh, one of them was a Cajun boy from Cutoff, Louisiana. That's the name of the town, Cutoff, Louisiana. And then the other was uh, uh, a guy who had a doctorate in food science. He was a, uh, a Korean guy. Uh, and so the Cajun boy was Herb Kiff, and the Korean guy was Kung Su Lee. And both of them knew that I was blessed and that I was a school teacher. So when I would take notes in class, they were very intricate. So every Friday, Dr. Lee and Herb would come to my room. They would get my notebooks, and they would go to the copy machine and copy every note I took because they knew how intricate it would be. But in the seminary, that, that was part of the joy. I, I was still being a school teacher while I was studying. And I, I actually used to still go over to Lafayette Elementary across the street, and I would teach American Sign Language to third graders because I, I wanted to make sure that I stayed involved in the schools. But after five years of being in the seminary, uh, I graduated, and then I had a chance uh, uh, when, when I was ordained. I was ordained on May 27, 1995. And I can tell you that it, it was an amazing day. Uh, you know, at the ordination, uh, the coolest thing was, you know, I watched my mama, you know, with a smile on her face. And of course, I watched my daddy cry the entire mass. But of course, my daddy cried for everything. But, uh, you know, the, the joy of, of that day definitely, you know, still sticks with me. And, uh, and just like a married couple, I'll open up the photo albums and I'll look back on that day and realize that that's when God really, you know, you know claimed me uh, to be his own. And I can tell you that my priesthood has been amazing. It has been amazing. To this day, 27 years later, I still look up, get up every day looking forward to what I get to do. I get a chance to, to really do so many things that, that I wish others had a chance to do. And, you know, uh, sometimes people think, well, Father, how can you do everything you do? And, you know, I'm full-time as a pastor, full-time as in a high school. And then I, I travel literally the world preaching. And they're like, well, how can you do all that? Well, it's simple. It's not what I do. It's who I am. It, it's who I am. It, it's the fulfillment of what God called me to be. And so, so preaching uh, as much as I do, I love it. I never forget when you, I, I was ordained about maybe two years, and my archbishop at the time, Archbishop Francis Schulte, asked me what was my hobby. And I said, well, Bishop, I preach. And he said, no, 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 no. What's your hobby? I said, Bishop, I preach. That's my hobby. He was like, wait, wait, wait. I said, Bishop, because I preach, 
I get a chance to travel the world. I've been to about 23 different countries. I get a tra chance to travel the U.S., been to uh, all the parts of the U.S., been to Hawaii like five times and somebody else paying for it. God is good. And I don't care what other people's hobbies could be. Nobody could tell me that a hole-in-one on a golf course could ever feel better than holding 23,000 teenagers in the palm of your hand at the National Catholic Youth Conference. I don't care what people say. Holding one, playing cards, whatever, boats can't come close to the power that God has when he uses you to bring young folk on a journey of faith. And so, so for me, what I do, it, it's, it's really who I am. And that's why I, I love my, my story, I love my journey, mainly because of the fact that I know that God is using me in ways that I could have never imagined. You know, when, when I was in elementary school, I, as I told you, I would never ever think that I would be a priest. Never ever thought of it. But somehow God saw something. People don't believe it, but in elementary school, I was probably one of the shyest kids that you could imagine. I was not the kid that wanted to be in front of everybody. I was not the kid that wanted to have the lead in, in the school play. In fact, in, in grade four, I remember that, you know, all I wanted to be in the play was the tree. Because the tree stood in the back and he held up the tree. That's all he did. But it was amazing how God could take that little shy kid and use him when he was finally willing to bring it to the table. That's why my dad, you know, when he would watch videos of me doing stuff, he would cry because he said, that's not the little boy I remember. And, and you know, it just is amazing to, to be able to, to share those kind of stories, those, those kind of journeys, because that's how my, my dad was. My dad was, was somebody that he would, he would say, you know, it's amazing that, that, that God could be using my son. But, you know, part of the challenge is to, to encourage other people, to encourage other folk to be true to yourself and bring who you are to the table. I, I fully believe that, that thousands and thousands of vocations go unfulfilled because, keep, because people are afraid to just answer the call. We are so blessed as Roman Catholics because in order for Jesus to come into our house, we need men and women who would dedicate their lives to the service of the church. They used to ask, well, what if it doesn't work out? It's not prison. You can get out. And I knew that if it didn't work out, I could probably go right back to being a school teacher. But if it's for you, I promise you it's going to work. If it's for you, I promise you it's going to, going to be a success. I can tell you that I'm excited to be able to celebrate at this altar with both of them. Because in a very real way, you know, as I get older, which I'm not willing to admit yet, but as I get older and my hairline keeps going further back. <laughs> just, just as a side note, like they, I, I tell people I have a receding hairline, it's receded to my neck. But I'm just saying, <laughs> they're like, like, to see younger priests come in with the same excitement that I had when I first was ordained. Y'all know I've been a priest now a long time, 27 years. That's a long time. Now, I ain't planning on stopping anytime soon, but the day is going to come when I, I have to depend on the younger guys. But I wanted to put them on the spot because I can do that. I'm the older priest. So, <laughs> but, but you see, y'all got to know that as priests, we get excited every time we have a chance to be with you. We get excited every time, time we get a chance to, to come together as a people of faith, and especially when we get to celebrate the Eucharist. And so I just encourage everybody to think about it, to, to ask God, what is it that he needs? You know, for me, all I did was say, Lord, here are the gifts that you have given me. How can you best use them to, for, the, for the sake of the kingdom, both here and when we get to heaven? Here are the gifts that I bring to the table. What can you do with them? And that's when I, I decided to go ahead to the seminary. Today, our challenge is to help our church continue to grow, to continue to prosper, and to make sure that we do have people fulfilling their vocation, be it in married life, single life, religious life, ordained ministry. We need everybody just answering the call, because no matter who you are, God needs you for something.